that courtesy is respecting our differences. So we understand that now. We should respect each other's differences. And this was a big one to me again. Because we're in relationships all the time. Remember, but we can never exist in isolation. So your friends, your teachers, your students, which are her loads, um, your clients, your marriage, husband and wife, your partners, boyfriend and girlfriend. So whoever you are in a relationship, parents and children, you, uh, uh, relate, cultivating community takes courtesy. Relationships take courtesy. And that means respecting each other's differences. We are all different. Being considerate of each other's feelings. Everybody's got different feelings. Are we respecting those differences? And being considerate of them. Being patient with other people who irritate us. Now this is a big one because he explained to us that we are meant to be dealing with people in this world that are going to bring all kinds of things to us. They're going to frustrate us. They're going to irritate us. And all of these things, how do we respond to it? That's what we're talking about. Being patient with people who are going to frustrate us and irritate us. Bible says we must bear the burden of being considerate. All the doubts and fears of others. Oh, thank you so much. Someone just thanked me. Um, she loves my work. Thank you so much. And she wish she was in England. You don't have to be in England to be part of what we do here. Like I showed you the home training pack. It is here for you to just use it and work wherever you are. That's the best way to go about it. Thank you so much. And we thank you for being here. So Bible says we must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubt and fears of others. Now that's a big one again. People have fears. We all have fears. We all have doubts. And community requires or relationship requires that we should be considerate of whatever this other person is afraid of. And Paul wrote, God's people should be big hearted and courteous. So as a child of God, open your heart to understand the fact that there are people out there who may not think like you? Who may not behave like you? Who may have doubts and may have their worries? We should be courteous of them. In every small group, people should be big hearted and cautious. In every small group, there is always at least one difficult person, usually sometimes more than one. Now this is a huge one. Because I found out that this is not just in communities out there. Even in families, there is always that one person that thinks differently. There is always that one person in the group of friends who sees things from another level. There's always that one person in this gathering in church who is not agreeing with everybody. There is always that one opinion in marriage that will not be to the betterment of everybody. So there is always someone out there who has something different to, to present. You see, these people may have special emotional needs. So this one person in this group that's difficult may have a uniquely emotional needs. And so these people may have their deep insecurities they may have the irritating mannerism, or they simply have poor social skills. This is just the way it is. And he calls these people EGR. And the meaning of EGR is extra grace required. So these people need extra grace of God. It doesn't mean that they are, they are not part of you. It just means that they need more attention. There are people like that, even in families. God put these people in our midst for both their benefits and ours. 
and I know when I've been confronted with, with situations like this, I always used to wonder, but why? Why is this person so different? See, there's a reason for it. God put that person there for their benefit and for our benefit. They are an opportunity for growth and a test of fellowship. Remember we said life is a test. So these people are there as tests to test your ability to be strong. We should love them and treat them with dignity. So it doesn't matter that they're different. Learn to love them and treat them with dignity. In a family, acceptance isn't based on how smart or how beautiful or how talented we are. So in a family, we just accept each other. It's not usually based on anything in particular. It is based on the fact that we belong to each other. And that's what generally happens in families. We defend and protect family members. So as a family member, you don't care what it is that happened. You just want to defend and protect each other. A family member may be a little goofy, but she's one of us. And that's just the way it is. And so the Bible says, be devoted to each other like a family. So whenever you're in this group of friendship or this community or this relationship, treat each other like a family. Even if the other party is a bit goofy. Excel in showing respect for each other. So we should learn to respect each other. The truth is we all have quirks. We all have quirks. And we can be annoying. We all go through those things. We may have annoying traits. We may have quirks of characters. But community has nothing to do with compatibility. The basis for our fellowship is our relationship to God. We are a family. So it's just saying that we may have quirks, we may be annoying or have annoying traits, but relationship has really nothing to do with, yeah, we must be perfectly compatible and all these points must match before we can develop a relationship. You see, one key to courtesy is to understand where people are coming from. That was a huge one for me. We need to understand where people are coming from. And I tell you, this is a huge one. Especially in marriage. Because what, what I remember to tell my friend, my kids sometimes is, you know, when you have friends and you find your friends are behaving a bit different, one thing we must learn is, we have different backgrounds and we don't know where they're really coming from. So when things are beginning to work out the way you were not really expected, just try and remember that they have a different background and you don't know what it is that's actually pushing this person to behave the way this person is behaving. Being true, you will be more understanding because if you could tell what this person has experienced in life and what's taking this person to this point, in time you probably will be a bit more understanding instead of thinking about how how far they, they still have to go think about how far they have come in no think about how far they have come in spite of their hearts so whatever it is they've been through in life we shouldn't be worried about how far they may end up we should be worried about or you we should be more excited about the fact that they've come from a really far place in spite of being hot wherever it is they've been through so another part of courtesy is not downplaying other people's doubts or fears or insecurities just because you don't fear something doesn't make it an invalid feeling or just because you don't lack something doesn't make it an invalid need for other people this just made me laugh because one of my daughter is absolutely scared and petrified of spiders and whenever she says oh mommy look at the spider and i just sit down there and i'm laughing i'm like but it's only spider i'm saying that it's only spider and then i get up and i go and kill the spider as the case may be and then she's really absolutely scared and she could and he's saying to us that in spite of just because you don't fear something doesn't make you an invalid feeling so just because I'm not afraid of spider doesn't make her fear invalid. And I'm generally afraid of snake. 
and my kids i mean we went out one time and these people actually came with live snakes and people were touching it and i was so far away from this snake and they were all touching it and that just goes to show i am afraid of snakes and they are not so when people are afraid of something it doesn't mean that that fear is invalid it is real so we really, really need to understand other people's point of view that's the big message here and you know i was also explaining that just because you know there we all have different needs in life i mean there there are those of us who are desperate to have more money in our lives and people who have money are just flaunting the money around like it's nothing and there are those of us who probably lack children there are homes that there's no child and the, 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 the couple are extremely worried about it. But you see some homes where this young girl, maybe early 15, 16, has gone crazy, has a child, and is treating the child like nothing. I mean, I, I was in a, a public transport once, and I saw this young girl. She had a beautiful, beautiful child in the pram. And this child was crying for the whole distance of this journey. This girl did not look at the child. She had her phone in her hands and she was just playing with the phone. And the child cried throughout the journey. And another lady who was so touched came and stood in her face and said, you're just lucky I'm not the, I'm not the government. I would have taken this child from you and you will never have seen this child again. And that's just the way it is. So when you have something, you don't see it as anything. And the person who lacks that thing is desperately crying to have that thing. That's just the way it is. So we should learn to appreciate the fact that everybody's coming from different quarters. Real community happens when people know it is safe enough to share their doubts and worries without being judged. So if someone's telling you what they feel and what they're experiencing in their life, it's not for you to sit on this high table and start judging them. And start telling them that they are talking absolute nonsense. Or what are you referring to? Was it not the other day? And you know, we tend to do that. And this relationship, this community he is reminding us to create is for us to appreciate the fact that nobody is the same. Cultivating community takes confidentiality. And that's the next thing he's trying to explain to us. Only in the safe environment of warm acceptance and trusted confidentiality where people open up and share their deepest hearts and needs and mistakes. So while you're in any relationship, it's only in a scenario where there is confidentiality that people can open up and share with you and tell you what they're feeling and their deepest hearts and their deepest worries. Because we, I mean, we see here most times and we get inquiries about our training. And the first thing I want to know is why do you really want to take on this training? Now I'm asking you that because I want to see how I can help you to achieve it. But you see people who come and all cagey because they don't know who you are and they have no clue how much they can open up to you. So most times I initiate the talk and I say, do you want this for a business? Do you want it for your personal family use? And so when you start opening up, then the message becomes clearer then people get the understanding that where they are coming to is a place that's ready and willing to help them and support them. But when you, when you go into a place which there are so many organizations that claim to train people in whatever it is, because I've been to so many trainings myself, and you get there and they don't even want to know why you want to do it. Because for them it's just a number. It's just statistics. They just want to see how many people are going to take on this training so they can make so much money and declare amazing profit. That's not what it should be. It's about relationship. And confidentiality is so important. The message I'm going to share with you, the information I'm going to give you, is it going to remain with you? So confidentiality does not mean keeping silent where your brother or sister sins. So it's not about people tell you something, oh, while they're doing some wrong, something wrong, you can just relax in the corner and allow them to carry on, and it's wrong. It means that what is shared in your group needs to stay in your group. And I've been to quite a few events 
where um the group needs to deal with it not gossip to other people about it so when people confide in you which is confidentiality they want you to leave it within there explain to them where they've gone wrong advise them where necessary but don't take it outside here god hates gossip he's explaining to us god says gossip is spread by wicked people they stir up trouble and they break up friendships gossip always causes hurt and divisions and God is very clear that we are to confront those who cause divisions among us. So, that's what it is. Confidentiality means keep it to yourself. But be there for the person. Advise the person. Support the person. And this is just, again, we're talking relationships. So within your friends, within your group of friends, uh, with the husband and wife, you know, you, you may be honest enough with your husband. You tell him something that you thought, oh yeah, this should remain with us. And before you know it, maybe his sister knows and all his friends knows and you're wondering, but I thought that was my husband I shared something with. And the same could also be with your with your wife or with your you know your your best friend. You thought this was your best friend and you shared something. Before you know it, somebody else is telling you the same thing, and you're wondering where did that come from? So relationships requires confidentiality. Cultivating relationships takes frequency. How regular contacts with people in order to build genuine fellowship. So if you're, if you're friends with people, stay in touch with them. Because creating that distance just breaks it. Relationship takes time. The Bible says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another. So we must learn to encourage one another. And frequency means we should stay in touch with each other. A habit is something you do with frequency, not occasionally. So he wants us to create this habit of being together as a clique, as a unit, as a group. We have to spend time with people a lot of time to build deep relationships. So if you want to understand people, you need to create time to be with them. Community is built not on convenience. We'll get together when I feel like it. That's not community. You don't create community by whenever you feel like it, then you show up. Because what then happens, we get too busy and we never create the time. It's like this program that I'm doing. I've decided to do this with you, 40 days of it. And now if I was looking at my schedule of work, I would not have even created time to be with it. So it's looking like our Instagram friends, we're going to lose you soon because our time on Instagram is up. But what will happen, just follow us on YouTube. Um, World of Braiding is a YouTube account. And then you carry on watching it. Because we still got more, more chapters or more pages on this very chapter. It's quite an interesting chapter. So just follow us on YouTube and get the remaining of the story. So we'll get together when I feel like it. But on the conviction that I need it for spiritual health. So for spiritual health. We need to be with each, other, with each other constantly in order to grow. If you want to cultivate fellowship, it will mean meeting together even when you don't feel like it because you believe it is important. So relationship requires you being together for us to grow spiritually. The first Christians met together every day. This is thousands of years ago. They met together every day. They worshiped regularly at the temple each day and in small groups, in homes for communion, and shared their meals with great joy and thankfulness. So that's what community is all about. Fellowship requires an investment of time. So putting time together constantly to create this relationship is very important for fellowship. If you are, not a, if you are a member of a small group or class, I urge you to make a group Convenient, covenant. It says we should make a group covenant. Something that binds us together as a group. Something that brings us together all the time. That will include the nine characteristics of biblical fellowship. So, as a member of a small group or a small class where we are agreeing to stay together as a group, we should make this covenant. And I remember one of the first things he made us sign in the beginning of this book is to sign and say we must do the 40 days. So that's a covenant, something that ties you. He said, 
it is important to double to help us develop our emotional health and characteristics so it starts to explain what it is this is the covenant we will share our true feelings so that's the covenant we will share our true feelings Authent authenticity that's what that means we will encourage each other that's mutuality we will support each other that's sympathy we will forgive each other that's mercy we will speak the truth in love that's honesty we will admit our weakness that's humility we will respect our differences that's courtesy we will not gossip and that's confidentiality we will make our group a priority and that's frequency so these nine things are what will keep the group together and empower us to grow spiritually so when we look at the list of the characteristics it is obvious why genuine fellowship is so rare this is why it's so difficult to put together groups because when you look at all these things it is very rare to get people who think and reason like this so it means giving up our self-centeredness so lots of us want to just grow as individuals and yet it is so important that we grow the benefits of sharing life together far outweigh the cost of living life out of each other's face okay so the benefits of sharing life together far outweigh the cost of not sharing life together it also prepares us for heaven or eternity so that's why we need to listen to the covenant go back on them when over and over and over when you can and the big message here for me in fellowship and relationship is about acceptance and acknowledgement so we are looking at acknowledgement and acceptance i was weighed down discovering that i was struggling to cope with people around me and this is what happened that actually pushed me to pick up this book to read i mean i've been through quite a lot just like everybody would say they have but it gets to a point where you completely get lost and you don't even know where to start from or go to anymore and this was happening to me i was way down from discovering that i was struggling to cope with people around me and people around me included so many people I was struggling with friends, I was struggling with my relatives, I was struggling with my children, I was struggling with my husband, I was struggling with my clients, and I was struggling with my acquaintances. So everyone around me, suddenly I was feeling completely lost. And when this was happening, I realized I had to do something. And like the man has explained, we all come from different backgrounds and we see things differently and understand things differently. And this causes so much confusion in our lives. For me personally, 2015 and 2016 opened a huge climax in this reality in my life and I needed to address it in order to carry on. Because you find lots of people end up being mentally ill, mentally ill, emotionally down because things so much is going on around them and they have no idea where to go for help and you know he's explained it in one of the chapters where he says we have this community and this relationship that are extremely thick and there's nothing there that is real because we have not understood all these nine points he's given us about how we can encourage relationship to grow and for me i needed to stabilize myself again i needed to wake up and understand what life meant again that was the reason i picked up this book and now i can confidently say i have an answers to so many of the questions i asked myself because you see for some people they probably run to their mom they probably run to their big brother they probably run to their best friend and these people listen and they answer them and they probably from experience they could tell them something but what I usually do over time, whenever I'm stuck and lost, I run to books. And I've shown you so many of these books that I've read over time. But one of the things I said was I was going to show you these new ones. I got this collection of DVDs or CDs that I listen to. This particular one was from Jim Rohn. And that cost me so much money. But I needed it because I needed to 
stabilize my way of thinking. There were two of them. Look at that. Two huge compilations. And I thought, yeah, that will help. And that's not enough. I keep looking at various programs. This one says Ultimate Ghost Program. This one was Theater of the Mind. Again, dealing with the mind. This one was Healing. And these are all various, various CDs and DVDs that I look at. Power of Visualization. So these are the kind of places I run to when things are completely down with me and I'm overwhelmed and I don't know where to go and so this time I listen to all the CDs and on YouTube as well all these things to help you open your mind and think again and then I remember this book that I'd read long time ago and I only read a few chapters and it's straightening my thoughts and I thought this is the time to read this book and that's what pushed me here so I took it on. It's answering a lot of questions in my life and I hope it's doing the same for you too. Because when you have issues to deal with around you, for the fact that none of us can stand alone and say we have a life, you cannot. You cannot say you love people when it's just you. So you have to learn to live with people. And the people you live with are varied because they come from various backgrounds. So this is where the big message is coming from. I have tried so much to try and understand people around me. To me, this has helped to settle me down. And I feel a lot lighter. Because getting to understand all these things. Remember, everything we deal with in life comes from the mind. And if you cannot sort out the mind, then you have a big problem. Because no matter where you are going, no matter what you are chasing, if the mind is not at peace and at rest to deal with it, you just end up nowhere. And the baggage of life, I call it. We cannot exist in isolation. We need to be with other people. Imagine a bag as we go through life. We take on things from each other and keep putting it into this bag. Being our own life. The bag is our life. And we're just coming, coming across from various places and we're just taking on things and putting in there and taking on things and putting in there. This bag gets full. If we don't let out the stuff as they come into our body, which is our mind, we get full and this becomes too heavy to carry. This is why I said you have to find a way to lighten the load. How much stuff have you taken on in your life? Without letting stuff out, you start to have emotional and mental problems. This is what I have been experiencing. And people will tell you all types of things. People around you will try and throw things at you. But remember, whatever you feel is what you feel. You feel it. Because if you don't feel it, you would not be going through the stresses you're having. People will tell um, I have tried various things. And these are the books I've shown to you. People will be people. No one is free of sin. We expect people to be like us all the time. And when this does not happen, a clash takes place. So this is why the baggage is coming up. Because we are hoping people will be the same as we are. But that's not the reality in life. People will be different. He has explained that in the book, that people are different. We don't know what baggage they're carrying. But we cannot change people. We have to accept them for what they are. This way we can carry on and nobody then breaks down for the other person. And so, as messengers of God, our biggest role is to deliver our message on this earth. And when we do that, we fulfill God's mission on earth. Now, think about whatever, whenever you send someone a message and they don't deliver it, how do you feel? And the message doesn't get delivered, how do you feel? But when you do send someone to do something and they actually did it perfectly the way you wanted it, imagine how excited you feel. That's exactly the same way I feel about us and God. Because he created us for a purpose. He gave us a message. And the minute we deliver that message, our life becomes whole. And God is so proud of us. Because then we have delivered his message well. So that just think about it. How you send someone to do something and they don't do it. And how you feel. And now you send someone to do something and they actually do it properly. You feel great. 
That's how I feel we should be. Because if we deliver the messages that God gave us, God is so proud of us. And this is another part that it gets interesting. Now, imagine sending a child a message. This happens a lot because I have children and I know. You send them, go and do something. And then on the way there, they find something else, they find something else. This thing distracts them, distracts them, and they completely forget that you sent them any message at all. This is how it feels like with us. We came on this earth with major messages on what's happening to us. We get distracted. This is where the whole distraction happens. We get carried away with school. All we want to do is go to school. We get carried away with money. All we want to do is chase money. We get carried away with, you know, various things, ridiculous things. And when we do that, what happens? We forget the big message that God sent us to deliver on earth. So where I'm coming from is we need to get back to our roots. But this is where I feel it too. Because at the point where I saw myself getting lost, I was having all these things going on around me. That's what's happening to all of us. We get so distracted with all these relationships that we have that we forget the bigger message. So can we get back on track and find our message? Because that's what this book is about. Purpose-driven life. Can we find the purpose why we are here? Because that's where we are. The minute we can find our purpose, our life becomes lighter. The minute we can take away these distractions, not in the sense of chasing everyone away, but in the sense of understanding everyone around us, the fact that we don't all come from the same background, the fact that we all have various packed packages, the fact that everybody's needs is different, the fact that we need good fellowship in our lives, that we need to understand each other, we need to be honest with each other, we need to sympathize with each other, the need that we just need to be, that is not about just us, but about other people. That's when we realize that we don't struggle anymore in life. So we struggle to fulfill our mission when we get distracted in life. Like a child on a message, these distractions cost our mission and years of unhappiness. I was falling apart too much going on at the same time. Um, I was falling apart too much was going on at the same time, but God's call is God calls it a test. We have to overcome it. And that's why I feel I have overcome by, by being able to pick up this book and getting all these clear messages. Seeking knowledge and, and help like this book has done for me has opened my way of thinking, has cleared my mentality, has made me more organized and focused. And this is what I'm calling a new life. Because once you can tell what's going on, once your mind is clear and all these distractions are making sense now, you are going to be a better person for it all. So be strong to overcome whatever test you are encountering. My mission here is to help you realize who you are. And that's what this chapter was all about. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, so before we go, I'll quickly read us the question. The question was, how can I help cultivate today the characteristics of real community in my small group and in my church? So in my small group could be anybody. You and your daughter, you and your husband, you and your friends, you and your, your clients, you and your students, you and whoever you interact with, whoever you have relationship with. How can I help cultivate today the characteristics of real relationship? So the meditation being, we understand what love is when we realize that Christ gave his life for us. That means we must give our lives for other believers. We must give our life to other people as well. We must understand the fact that it's not just about us, but it's about other people. He said um, not to think less of ourselves, but to think, to give ourselves less thinking about ourselves so thank you so much and um, that meditation was from first john chapter 3 verse 16
thank you so much for listening to today's today has been really really long and we may end up making it two clips thank you again and god bless you eternally i look forward to seeing you in the next chapter